Okay. Uh, first of all, thanks to the organizers uh, for the opportunity to speak here. Um, I also uh, wanted to uh, express my sincere regrets that I had to miss the first uh, half. I, uh, I had a um, previous uh, obligation, um, but uh, I'm happy to hear that the videos are online so I can catch up on what I missed. Um, <coughs> speaking of missing the first half, uh, I noticed that my abstract uh, featured only the first half. Um, so I think that's fitting. Um, so uh, uh, what I want to talk about is uh, uh, quantum cluster varieties um, uh, via, uh, as, as they were introduced by Fat Gontroff and uh, how I've come to understand them as an instance of factorization homology uh, as uh, introduced by Ayala, Francis, and Tanaka. Um, just quickly before I get started, I want to advertise uh, a, a pair of workshops. Uh, so th in, in happening in Edinburgh uh, in June, there's uh, two weeks. Uh, there's a summer school, which is happening the 3rd through the 10th. And then there's the conference week, uh, the next week, happening the 10th through the 14th. Um, and so uh, we have an uh, excellent lineup of speakers. Um, and uh, I'm hoping that uh, many of you can, can, uh, can make it. Um, so for the summer school, there's, uh, or sorry, yeah, for the summer school, there's uh, some uh, uh, funded uh, positions for, for students and postdocs, and, uh, and people who attend the school will also be funded to attend th for the next week. Um, so uh, I hope you can help me advertise this. Um, <coughs> okay, uh, so that's that. I don't need the uh, projector anymore. Okay, so um, I want to start by just uh, recalling uh, uh, Falk and Gunshroff's construction. Um, uh, oh, sorry, first I'll start by reviewing character varieties and their quantizations. Okay, and then I'll uh, give a, a more detailed uh, discussion of. of Fucking gun truff. Uh, now, uh, so these cluster algebras, qu quantum cluster algebras, uh, they're um, really complicated. There's a lot of uh, uh, a lot to say about them, uh, and in some sense, part of the the point of this work is that I I never really understood the axioms of cluster uh, algebras, and I wanted to bypass those. So so my uh, presentation of fucking gun truff. Construction will be a bit biased uh, and a bit uh, abbreviated, um, but I need to give you the main details, and then uh, and then I'll uh, talk to you about uh, factorization homology approach and uh, and parabolic parabolic induction. Okay. So I think uh, we know. Uh, what is meant by the character variety of a surface. Um, so we look, so equivalently we can think about representations of pi 1 of the surface into our favorite group G. Uh, so G can be any reductive group for what I'll say, but uh, I'm especially going to focus attention on GLN, and even the case GL2 is interesting for today. Uh, so if, we're, if we are algebraists, we can think about just uh, maps from the fundamental group into G, modulo conjugation action, uh, or if we're a bit more topological, uh, we can think about uh, G local systems uh, uh, on S uh, regarded up to isomorphism. Okay, so that's the, the character variety. Um, <coughs> and so a basic problem. Is this is, uh, is singular in general? Um, <coughs> but uh, but so even at, uh, regarded as a singular variety, it carries a canonical Poisson bracket. Uh, Vatia, Bott, and Goldman, which I imagine people here are familiar with. Okay, and so uh, a, a long-standing question uh, that's been answered in many different ways is sort of what's the right uh, way to quantize this uh, Poisson structure, uh, taking into account the singularities, 
uh, and, uh, and trying to do this in as natural a way as possible. So, um, so, so one way to, uh, to uh, deal with the singularities uh, is uh, just to pass to the character stack. So, uh, so consider I'll denote it with an underline the character stack. Uh, yeah, uh, I will consider both both cases. Yeah, it's interesting in in, in all these cases. Um, yeah, as, as you're alluding to, it's 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 much easier when the surface has at least one puncture. Um, uh, but uh, we can also consider this the stack when it's closed. Um, indeed, when it's closed, then uh, even working with the stack doesn't quite deal with the singularities. We also have to um, um, worry about uh, taking derived intersections. Okay, and so I in this context, uh, sort of a motivating result. Lindsay, Francis, and Nadler says that if we study the category of co quasi coherent sheaves on the character stack of a surface, again, S is either closed or open, um, this is the factorization homology of the category of representations of our group uh, G. And uh, so they proved this in the, in the setting of infinity categories, the derived uh, setting. Uh, and uh, uh, in work I'll mention later, uh, we also proved that the same thing holds just at the abelian level. Okay, so whether you take the derived category or the abelian level, the point is that the classical character variety is computed just by the factorization homology of rep G. Uh, so with... Uh, So with uh, David Benzvi, Adrian Brochet, and myself, we, uh, we introduced a quantization, which I'll denote by ZQS. And, uh, and the definition of this is just uh, we take the factorization homology of the category of representations of the quantum group. So that's a braided tensor category, an E2 algebra, and so it makes perfect sense to compute uh, factorization homology in this sense. And we propose this as the sort of most natural quantization of the character stack. Okay, so that's just a definition. Um, but uh, so there are, I, 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 this is not a talk about this construction, but I'll just, uh, for context, say so we uh, described, so for punctured surfaces, which I'll, I'll indicate with a, with a circ here, uh, we wrote these as uh, modules of algebra, uh, mo of categories of modules for a certain algebra in rep QG. And these algebras uh, we identified, these are isomorphic to certain very explicit uh, algebras introduced uh, in the 90s by Alexeyev, Grossa, and Shomarus. Okay. So um, it, when, when your surface is punctured, then the, the pi 1 is just a free group. And so the character variety, the character stack is just a, bu a bunch of copies of G uh, considered up to simultaneous conjugation action. And uh, using that presentation, uh, so, so first Fock and Rossley uh, uh, for punctured surfaces, they rewrote the atiyah uh, uh, poisson bracket in a, in a way using classical R matrices. And then, um, <coughs> inspired by this, Alexeyev, Gross, and Shomarus, they simply proposed by generators and relations an algebra, uh, uh, called the, which I call the AGS algebra, uh, which, um, where you simply replace the R matrices and the relations with, with quantum R matrices. And uh, so you define by generators and relations a quantization um, but you have to do it by hand, and you have to make some choices on the surface. Okay, so the nice thing about factorization homology is this, is this category is completely canonical without any choices. And what we showed is that if once you have this canonical thing, then you go and make some choices, then you recover these nice algebras that uh, people introduced in the 90s. Okay, so that was the sort of um, uh, uh, um, uh, 
uh, story for punctured surfaces. Uh, for closed surfaces, I'll just say, uh, I'm not going to really focus on this today, but um, we uh, describe um, ZQ of S for closed surfaces uh, via quantum Hamiltonian reduction. Okay. Um, <coughs> and uh, I'll also say that uh, work in progress of uh, one of my PhD students relates uh, these to the so-called skein, skein algebra, skein categories that people studied also in the 90s. Okay, so the, uh, the upshot is that uh, for ordinary character varieties, these, uh, these quantizations are sort of the universal thing, and because they're the universal thing, you can start connecting them to whatever you want. Okay, um, so but before all this uh, business about stacks and uh, uh, character stacks and factorization homology and so on, um, there's, a, there's another way to deal with both the quantization question and the singularity question, uh, which was the idea of Fock and Gontroff. Okay, uh, and what they, uh, what they did is they said, let's consider a different, a slightly different variety. Uh, okay, so instead of a surface S, they consider what I'll call a parabolic surface. And uh, a parabolic surface for, so in the fock gontroff notation, so in fock gontroff notation, uh, uh, what, what I'm calling a parabolic surface, uh, they would call, I think, a decorated surface, uh, you, you have a surface, it may have uh, boundary components, proper boundary components, and it may have what they call punctures. And uh, the boundary components are required to have certain uh, uh, marked points. And the punctures we also regard as uh, sort of a marked point. And uh, they suggested to consider a, a, a different variety. So I'll just write it like this. OK. Um, sorry. Right, and so uh, what we consider is uh, we consider uh, G-local systems on S together with uh, a, a, a reduction to the Borel uh, at the marked points and a T-framing at the marked points. Okay, and we consider these up to isomorphism. Okay, so if you're not a geometer, then this uh, reduction to Borel might be, um, might require some explanation. Th there's only really two cases to consider. Um, basically, this is some extra data that we, uh, that we uh, attach. Uh, so if you have a mark point on the boundary, then this reduction to Borel is just the choice of a flag. And in uh, in the f in the fiber uh, over the mark point. Okay, and if your mark point is at a puncture, um, then it's the same thing. But uh, there's a condition that it be preserved by the holonomy around the puncture. Okay, so what they said is, all right, I don't, they, they didn't like the singularities that come from stabilizers, and, uh, and they basically rigidified the problem. They said, well, okay, we're going to add some extra data of some, uh, of some flags uh, at the mark points and some compatibility uh, uh, in the case of punctures. And then, the, so that's the, that's the reduction to, to Borel. And then uh, the T-framing, so, so the way I've phrased it here, the moduli space is G mod N, and the T framing just says we'll replace this by, uh, sorry, is G mod B, and you replace this by G mod N. So you consider not just a flag, but you pick a basis in each step of the flag, uh, which is just you know a choice of a single vector in each uh, in each uh, co kernel, and uh, and so uh, so that so so basically you're just uh, 
um, uh, replacing uh, G mod B by G mod N, but now it has a residual T, T action. A line, sorry. Uh, y yes, a line, yeah. Well, uh, no, sorry, a, a vector here, and, uh, a, a, and, and if, if we quotient by that T action, then we only consider the line. Okay, so this, so this would be a, a line, and, and in here we really, we really pick a, a vector. Okay. All right. And uh, so what's interesting about this, uh, this choice uh, that, they, that they make is now, uh, so, uh, and, and now when we consider up to isomorphism, I don't mean as a stack. I really mean we take just, we, we, we quotient uh, uh, in a geometric sense by isomorphisms. And uh, the thing that you get in this case, because you've added these extra framings, is still nice. Um, so uh, this has the structure of a, uh, of a cluster variety. Okay. Um, and so roughly a cluster variety X is, is a variety uh, which is covered by a bunch of charts, U alpha. And each U alpha is, uh, is homeomorphic to just a, uh, an algebraic torus, C star to the R. Uh, and these are all the same, it's the same dimension R every time. Uh, and moreover, there's a, a Poisson bracket on X, which is quadratic. In each uh, in each chart, so what that means, so so I'm saying that the each chart functions on it is just a Laurent uh, ring and several variables, uh, and the Poisson bracket, this is this famous uh, formula, is the, the Poisson bracket is just uh, x i times x j times some integer a i j, and I'm going to say a little bit more about how you extract these integers in a second. Um, so the Poisson bracket is, is sort of uh, is sometimes called log canonical. It's just uh, it's it, the, the Poisson. Uh, so th this is what you would expect if you uh, try and do uh, sort of canonical Poisson structure on a on a torus for some matrix A I J here. Uh, and so uh, right. And so now if you have two of these different tori uh, and, and you glue them together, uh, the transition maps. They have to preserve this Poisson bracket in the suitable sense. And so that uh, implies essentially, so that's almost in the sense I don't want to get into, implies that the, the transition maps are these cluster transformations. Okay, so very specific ways that you change variables when you move between these charts. And so combinatorially minded people love to write down these formulas that I never understand. Um, but it's really just uh, encoding the fact that this Poisson bracket needs to be globally defined. All right, so let me explain uh, just a, a tiny piece of how they construct these charts, and I want to do it uh, just in the case of GL2. Okay, because uh, um, I always found this procedure very mysterious, and, uh, and I'm hoping that you will also find it mysterious. And then I want to explain why it's just what happens when you read the Ayala Francis Tanaka manual on um, factorization homology. I think that's interesting. Okay, so what you do is you triangulate your surface. So they say you first need to choose a triangulation. Okay. Just to show you how bad I am at this, uh, we'll pretend that's a triangulation. Okay, so you cover the thing with triangles, uh, um, and the uh, the only thing that the only stipulation is that the endpoints of the triangle need to be at one of your marked points, um, and that's it. Okay, so the endpoints of the triangles are are at your endpoints, and uh, and so the first thing they do is they tell you what to do with a triangle. Um, okay, so uh, l let me show you, I will show you quickly just GL3 so you can see the difference, but then uh, I want to uh, move to, to GL2 
two from for the rest of the talk. That's simply just because otherwise you have to get into the like the combinatorics of root systems and stuff. And for SL two, you see all the basic ideas without all the um, without all the, the fuss. Okay, so what they would do is they would draw a triangle like this, and they draw some squares <laughs> on the edges, and on the inside they draw uh, a, a circle. Uh, and here for GL2, something nice which happens is that there are no internal ones. Okay, and then uh, there's a certain quiver that they draw that sort of looks like the Triforce, if you're a Zelda fan. Okay, and, um, and uh, so here it's just like so. And, uh, and, okay, so what you do to get these charts, the C star, star to the R, the chart associated to this has uh, C star to the uh, number of uh, box, uh, boxes, okay, plus the number of uh, circles, okay? So you have a variable for each one of these things. And then those AIJs, are just coming from the adjacency matrix of the quiver that I've drawn here. So they're like plus minus one or two depending or, or, or more. So I can, I, I've only drawn uh, with, uh, without repeated edges, but you're allowed to have multiple edges stacking, okay? Um, and so, so the AIJs are just this thing. So they tell you that they just declare uh, from the sky that this is what you should do to a triangle. And then they say that when you glue two triangles together, along some edge, so let me again just do GL3 and uh, GL2. What happens when you glue along uh, uh, two triangles along an edge is that these square ones uh, that you've glued, they now become uh, circles, and you still have the circles that you had before, and then the edges that you... Uh, and the, 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 the squares remain squares. Uh, so, so in SL2 already you get uh, now a circle here. Uh, and there's a, there's a simple calculus for how you, uh, how you fill in a, a quiver here, um, which, I, which I won't go into. But so so you, you basically just glue these quivers together. And uh, so, so in, the, in their... Uh, Terminology, these squares are called frozen, and the circles are, I guess, unfrozen. Okay. All right, so you keep doing this. Uh, uh, you keep gluing these triangles together, and then in the end what you get is basically you get a, uh, a quiver, some complicated quiver that you've drawn on your thing. It's somehow... Uh, in, in some way related to your triangulation, uh, and then only on the boundaries do you ever get these frozen things because you've glued all the internal edges together, and so you, you just have these, this boundary here. Okay? It's geometrically better to replace squares like half squares. Yeah, well, talk to them. <laughs> um, <coughs> All right, and so, uh, okay, and so, uh, so in the end what you get is uh, each triangulation leads you to uh, some, uh, some chart, C star to some rank, and uh, what they say is that you can think of this as a chart. This is some U alpha. Uh, these actually, they tell you that these actually should correspond to functions on the, uh, on the, their, uh, the character variety for this parabolic surface. Okay. And then there's an interesting, uh, so of course if you change triangulation you get different charts. Uh, so you get, you get one of these for each chart. Um, I should say also uh, for SL2 that's, that's basically it. Uh, in other types there's some more data that you have to in indicate. So each of these triangles is colored by some, some root data that I don't want to go into. Okay. Can you tell us what the open set is in the character? 
It's it's a bit of a pain. I mean, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yes, I will get there. At least for the the triangles, we'll start to see it as I as I do the the rest of the analysis, and and then basically, as I will try to explain to you, you just glue these open sets together in some st standard way from triangles, and so yeah, that that that'll be a major part of the talk. Okay. So this always baffled me. I mean, why why should you do that? Why do those give functions? That's a good question. Um, uh, uh, so you get this Poisson bracket. They, they claim, as far as I know, well, I don't know what the status of this uh, this claim is for general G, but that this uh, this uh, Poisson bracket here is the Atiyah bot. Somehow it, you should think of it as the Atiyah bot uh, Poisson bracket. Um, and uh, well, so so the rest of the talk, I just want to uh, uh, come to an understanding of this construction and, in particular, its quantization using factorization homology. Um, so, uh, okay. So I kind of gave myself an easy job because I wanted to convince you this was confusing, so I just have to do a bad job uh, explaining it. Uh, and uh, I think I've done well. Um, <coughs> right, I should say, uh, right, before I go on though, the point, so th for them, a, a very important point of this simple Poisson bracket is that when you quantize such a Poisson bracket, you, you simply say that xi xj equals q to the aij xj uh, xi. If you think about that, that's a sort of obvious quantization of this uh, thing. And, uh, uh, and so, so their quantization of these character varieties that they proposed is what they call a quantum cluster ensemble. Uh, you, you, you don't say sort of once and for all what the quantum gadget is. You say what all these charts are, and then you, uh, you quantize uh, all the change of variables between the charts, and you just declare that whole system of all these, uh, of all these um, uh, quantum tori together with their changes of variables. You declare that to be your quantum character variety. Okay, so I, I would like to understand how to connect that to these... Uh, to this character stack story. Um, and I just want to give one piece of motivation why this is not just uh, me revisiting the 90s. Um, so uh, Demofte and, uh, and subsequently Demofte, Gabella, and Gontrov, they proposed an algorithm to compute so-called quantum A polynomials of knots. Uh, and and uh, what they do is they say you should um, uh, not just triangulate uh, surfaces like we're doing here, but you should learn how to triangulate uh, th three manifolds. So if K is a hyperbolic knot, Um, th they explain that if you look at, uh, at the complement of this knot, um, this can be uh, tiled by, uh, tetra by ideal tetrahedra. And an ideal tetrahedra, uh, tetrahedron is something like this. So it's a tetrahedron. Um, but at the end, there are these facets. Uh, and uh, and these uh, so you can tile the complement by these uh, by these uh, facets, and uh, and the point is that the the union of all these facets, union of the of the facets, is a triangulation of the torus. Okay, because they, the, 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 um, the, the union of them is just the boundary of the three manifold, and if you've constructed the three manifold by deleting a knot, then you've just got a triangulation of the torus. And then they say, uh, uh, well, we can um, now uh, take this triangulated torus, do fat gantra uh, description, and we get all these nice uh, quantum tori. And then uh, they explain how to use these uh, quantum tori. Uh, to, to compute the, this uh, so-called quantum A polynomial, which is a very nice uh, invariant of knots that's still quite mysterious. 
Okay, um, but the problem with the prescription, as, uh, as, as Tudor says quite uh, well in his, uh, in his first paper on this subject, is that uh, this choice of triangulation, uh, tetrahedral triangulation, it's, it's, um, it's a choice that you need to make, yeah? And, uh, and so you, you, you don't know that the, the corresponding uh, computation that you've done for the would-be quantum A polynomial is well-defined. Um, and so, um, as a first step, I want to explain that the Fagantroff thing is not a choice, it's a canonical construction. And, uh, and these charts are the choices that we are allowed to make once we know it's canonical. And then once we have a three-dimensional theory, uh, uh, again using uh, ideas from factorization homology, then we can actually prove, start proving things uh, I I about their, their construction. So we can prove, for instance, that there is a well-defined invariant, and they're just making choices to compute it. All right. Um, so let me get into the, um, the uh, story about factorization homology now. OK, so. Uh, Ayala Francis Tanaka plus um, some, uh, some modification of uh, ben Bensby Francis Nadler uh, tells us that uh, if we want to understand quasi coherent sheaves on these uh, uh, parabolic surfaces, we can also compute this, uh, so I'll stop using the integral notation just because it gets a bit cumbersome. So we can compute this as factorization homology of our parabolic surface with coefficients, and now this is going to need some explanation. So before we only had to tell you a group G, but now I need to tell you uh, the group B and the group T. So these are going to be our local coefficients for a factorization homology theory. And, uh, and what this means is that whenever I see a, uh, a line defect, it, so a parabolic surface, ah, ah so there's one, one thing I need to say. So, so in Fat Gantreff, so I want to translate between these pictures. So you had punctures and marked points. Okay, and so to connect to factorization homology, we just have to do a sort of trivial change of perspective. So if I see a marked point, I'm just going to replace that by a line, a, cur a, you know, a contractible curve. I'm going to label the curve by B. I'm going to label the inside by T. And the bulk of the surface is labeled by G. And similarly, when I see a marked point, I'm going to uh, grow that into a little um, uh, line here. And I'm again going to mark that by G, uh, that by B. The bulk is always G, and the inside is T. Okay, so this is just the same data, just a different way to think of it. And now, um, to, uh, ordinarily in, uh, in sort of unstratified factorization homology, uh, we, we have to specify some braided tensor category that we assign to the bulk of some surface. So that's G. Um, we have another braided tensor category, which is just rep T. And then B is a, is a one morphism in a suitable uh, category. Um, this is sort of uh, um, explained in various places. I think uh, in Claudia's thesis, there's a nice exposition of why you should think of these as one morphisms. Uh, so you have B on the line, you have G here, and you have T here. Okay. And uh, as a sort of spoiler, when we quantize, we'll have rep QG. Here we'll have rep QB, and here we'll have rep QT. And, uh, and there, there's, a, there's something you need to check, which is that rep QB has the structure to be an interface between rep QG and rep QT. This is sort of classical. Um, some, some way, the way you construct the R matrix for rep QG is a sort of quantum double of rep QB. And that's, that is, you trace through that, that tells you that this is a, a morphism it, you know, between these two braided tensor categories. It's the kind of thing that you can mark here. All right. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Speak, what does this picture mean? So, uh, uh, what does what picture mean? I mean, this, the one I have at the bottom. So somehow it's This one. Yes. Yeah. So in stratified factorization homology, 
um, you consider a stratified, let's say, surface. So this is a stratified surface. Uh, the uh, principal strata I need to label by some local coefficients. But those local coefficients are some E2 algebra. This is what we learned from uh, Ayala Francis Tanaka. And the uh, one-dimensional strata uh, are their, uh, a locally, what's called a locally constant factorization algebra on this stratified space. So and the idea is that somehow, uh, okay, the idea is like every point on this stratified uh, surface either looks like this thing, uh, this thing, or this thing. So this thing is what tells us what to do with points like this. In this sense, the to be treated as just monoidal case, but not braided, yeah? It's not braided, that's a good point, but it's, so let me uh, say more specifically what we need from RepQB. We have a uh, braided tensor functor from RepQG, tensor RepQT, with the reverse braiding to the Drenfeld center of RepQB. So this is what's sometimes called a, um, a GT central monoidal category. So it's not just a monoidal category. It has to have these anchor maps um, uh, down to rep QB. And these, uh, so, so the first map here, this is just uh, from rep QG to rep QB, that's just the forgetful functor. From rep QT to rep QB, that's just the pullback under the projection. And then I'm claiming that this has a canonical central lift uh, which comes from the, the quantum double construction to give you a braided tensor functor like this. And so, uh, yeah, I'm going to get these questions. Uh, th this structure right here, of a pair of braided tensor categories, a monoidal category, and a, f a functor to the Drenfeld center, that is what one unwinds to be the allowable local coefficients for a one-dimensional defect between two uh, two-dimensional um, between two E2 algebras. Okay, and so, right, I, di I didn't give a formula for factorization homology because I'm sort of taking that as, as given in this, uh, in this audience, but I'll, I'll say that uh, the idea is the same as you do for ordinary factorization homology. Uh, for ordinary factorization homology, I would sort of uh, cover this thing by disks, and then I would uh, correspondingly have some sort of co-limit that I need to compute, and I would compute that in the category of categories two category of categories. Uh, here, as well, we cover this thing by disks, but now there are three types of disks. And so we write some, this, this thing is just defined as some co-limit of uh, all the ways of embedding uh, these three kinds of disks uh, and their disjoint unions into S. And then uh, we have some term, which is just, uh, which is just rep QG to the number of uh, G disks. Uh, rep QB to the number of B disks and rep QT to the number of T disks. So uh, b basically these, um, so every time that we would uh, give a partial covering of this by these three different types of disks, we would write down the corresponding uh, categories uh, and then uh, we take a co-limit in categories and we, we get some answer. Okay. So if that sounds like uh, hopelessly abstract, somehow the whole point of uh, my research program is that using tools from quantum groups, you can actually unwind this and make it quite explicit. That's what I'd like to do. Uh, that's what we already did in the unmarked case uh, with uh, Benzby and Brochet, and that's what I'd sort of like to do now uh, in the parabolic case. Okay. No, uh, it is the same uh, as a... It's a, it has a different braiding. It's the same as a monoidal category, but it has the quadratic, uh, the standard quadratic pairing giving you the braiding. And that's important. I mean, to get this structure, you have to fix that particular one. Absolutely. All right. So uh, it is sort of uh, implicit. So the definition uh, with, uh, okay, Le, uh, Schrader, Shapiro, uh, myself. Uh, just completely following what we did with Benzie and Brochet is uh, the, the quantum invariant uh, we just defined to be the factorization homology of uh, the parabolic surface uh, with rep QG, rep QB, and rep QT. I do apologize for sort of skipping over this um, 
uh, this sort of calculus, it would be a whole lecture in, in itself, um, and we wouldn't get to the, uh, the punchline in that case. No, no, you start with, so in, in factorization homology, you start with an E2 algebra in whatever, and you end up with just an object in whatever. So here we started with a, we started with a braided, a braided tensor category, which is an E2 algebra in categories, and at the end we just get a category. Um, precisely, the braiding comes from symmetries of a disk, and if you take a general surface, you, it doesn't have the same symmetries. Okay, so, right, so what I want to explain now is uh, some examples. So they're the, they're the most important examples. So let's look at, uh, um, okay, so this thing, this is just rub QB by construction, uh, and I'm going to call this conf1. So this is ZQ of conf1. Uh, and uh, in general, uh, the first ca class of examples I want to give you is, uh, uh, is where we take a, a disk, G, and we put N of these little uh, parabolic induction and restriction things around the boundary, so that's conf N. And of course here, I, I'll, I'll stop worrying about G or rep QG. I mean, uh, uh, you can treat the classical and the quantum story in the same breath, that's the whole point. So this is uh, conf, conf n, so I have a parabolic restriction, uh, uh, restriction along uh, each of these things and a t-framing. All right, so if you think about this, all this is saying is that conf n as a uh, stack is just g mod n cross g mod n. So the number of, uh, of mark points. That's just the fact that I have to fix a framed flag at each point. It's by definition. And then when we consider it up to isomorphism, I want a quotient by the G action, uh, which is just uh, simultaneously changing the trivialization on the left, and by the T to the N action, uh, uh, the torus acts on, on the right. Uh, the, uh, rather, I don't want a quotient by this. I want to just remember it. So in this business, it's... Yeah, in case you might have a G mod N or a G mod B. Right, because I, I think you um, yeah, uh, missed this, so... Uh, uh, so, so once again, uh, but you wrote the reduction to B. Yes, the reduction to B and a T framing. I think that was before, before you arrived. Yeah, 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 this is an important point. I mean, it's not such a big deal, but it, it's, it's necessary. But it's just, I mean, reduction to B and T framing is the same as just reduction to M, isn't it? That's right. Uh, yeah, but I, but I remember the T action. Yeah. <coughs> That's right. Okay. Um, uh, very good. Okay. So, <coughs> all right. So, it, uh, so, so a sort of feature of these uh, factorization homology theories is that the categories you get, they always have a distinguished object. Um, and so, in fact, this distinguished object is the one which gave rise to these uh, AGS algebras, and that's somehow a big, a big uh, important point for me. Um, so what I want to understand is, what does this uh, distinguished object look like in these cases? And, uh, and I'll just, uh, I think I'd just like to state that if I, uh, if I take the endomorph internal endomorphisms of this distinguished object, so I'll say what I mean by that in a sec, what I get is isomorphic to a copy, so I take OQG mod N, tensor OQG mod N. This is, okay, so this is the standard quantization, sort of FRT style quantization of the, uh, the coordinate ring of this, the standard affine space. Uh, and this is uh, the braided tensor product. of algebras, and this all takes place in rep QG tensor rep QT uh, to the N. Okay. And now I can explain what I mean by internal endomorphisms.
So uh, see that this is where the T and the G action are so useful. I can uh, I, I've uh, I can this category just carries an action of G rep QG just by inserting disks into the into the boundary here and rep QT by inserting disks into the boundary here. So if you're familiar with how we proceeded in the unmarked case, it's the same thing, but now we have these additional sites, and they're acted on by an even simpler gauge group, rep QT. Okay, so we can exploit that. So that says that this is a module category for that braided tensor category, and a fun thing to do in that case is compute internal endomorphisms. And the claim is just like we got these AGS algebras uh, by just doing some standard uh, playing with adjoint functors and so on. When you do it in this setting, you exactly get the expected quantization of the um, standard affine spaces. Okay, so that's a computation. How is this statement related to the previous statement that quant n is, is equal to this product? Well, when q equals 1, then I'm saying that... Uh, there are kind of quotient by g. In Right, and here I'm working G equivariantly and T equivariantly. So, so it's, I mean, whether I, so it's, if I work G equivariantly, that's the same as considering the stack quotient mod G. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, you know what the labels on the arrows say? This? Yeah, sorry. This says the braided tensor product of algebras. So if I have algebras in a, in a braided tensor category, there's a canonical way to combine them, and they don't commute. They commute using the braiding. It's the only thing you can write down. Uh, and uh, this says the standard FRT construction. Um, so if you don't know what that is, it's just there's a canonical way to deform functions on G mod N. Um, let me make a remark, actually, about this. This is, I think, useful. So this is the same as the FRT quantization of uh, G. So it's just a Q deformation of functions on G. And then we take n invariance. And so if you think about pater weyl theorem, that's just the direct sum of uh, over lambdas. I have the irreducible representation v lambda. That tells me how g acts on this thing. And t acts with weight um, uh, chi, which is uh, minus omega naught Lambda, so that's just the lowest weight for the for the representation. Okay, so the, the highest weight for the dual representation, um, and so so if you forget about that for a second, I'm just saying that this is a direct sum, one copy of each irreducible representation of G. It's quite a harmless thing, and then I'm saying that there's a grading on it by the by T, and that is given with this weight. Okay, so this is like a very lovely thing, and when you multiply coordinates, it couldn't be easier. V lambda tensor V mu has a canonical projection onto v lambda plus mu, and that's how you multiply. Okay, so note, if you tensor v lambda tensor v mu, you get a whole bunch of different things with different multiplicities, but I'm saying that the multiplication in this algebra, because you're fixated on highest weights, it only preserves the thing of the correct weight. All right, so this is a very easy algebra to work with somehow. This n is confusing. Yes, it's very important. This is the same n. Yeah, same n, yeah. yeah so, sorry. Sorry, so did, did you say what the category was in this case, or, or, or you didn't? This is the category that we, we take as a definition. Right, but in this conf m case, is there an explicit answer for the, what the category is? No, yeah, okay, good question. Yeah, yeah, excellent question. So, so here I'm talking about the coordinate algebra of functions. You, you may be familiar that like g mod n is not an affine space. So it's a little bit dodgy to start all of a sudden talking about this, this, dist, this dist object is going to be like global functions. But let me remind you that that's the same thing that happens in Gontroff. They do not study the stack or indeed even the variety uh, of, of these parabolic local systems. They only ever study global functions on it. So they, they themselves are only ever working up to co-dimension two. So indeed, the correct sort of quantum invariant is this one. But if I want to con connect to Falk-Gontroff, I had better start studying uh, the algebras of functions. And so uh, this is what justifies me looking at this. So, the, so somehow the distinguished object corresponds to taking global sections. That's a In other words, you're saying that there's a functor from your category to modules over that algebra. Yeah, yes, there's a functor of global sections, or just taking Homs with this object. Um, now, note, I should say one thing. So this was the internal endomorphism. So to get to what you're, what you're saying, I need to take the invariance. So I want to take uh, this thing, 
and I need to take the g cross t to the n invariance. So this thing is kind of the stack, uh, uh, but but still global sections on uh, you know still still the the structure sheaf on the stack, and if I want to go down to the variety, which is where they work, I need to take invariance for the group that just quotients out by the gauge group action. Yeah, these are really good questions. Thank you. Okay. <coughs> We do want invariance yeah. on G. Yes, that's right. We want yeah, sorry, again. We want to take G invariance, but we want to remember the T action. So that's going to be important when we start amalgamating. Um, okay. So what have we done? We've so I should have said that this thing, this algebra, is what Fakantroff assign to the quantization of this thing. So so far. We're just uh, following uh, the Ayala Francis Tanaki prescription, and we get exactly what they do for, for disks, at least, with many punctures. Um, uh, uh, but there's a few, there's a few uh, caveats even for disks. So, so I want to zoom in on Comp3 uh, and, uh, and, then comp, and then go back to Comp2. So, um, so for Comp3, so this thing is not a quantum torus. So, so, so I'm, I'm, I'm misleading you somehow. Even when I take G invariance, this is not a quantum torus. It does not have these xij coordinates, even when I take G invariance. So there's two steps that we need to do. So first of all, wh wh what we end up looking at is uh, uh, G mod n, tensor G mod n. Okay, and that's just the sum of the lambda tensor v mu, tensor v nu. Okay, and so if, for instance, this this kind of calculus is uh, in Chen and Gonchav, wasn't quite explicit in the original papers, but it's certainly there. So we look at a triple tensor product of irreducible representations, and we want to know when are there g invariants. And uh, and what you find so so in type A I think this is Chen and Goncharov and in general type this was due to Ian Lay as far as I understand um, there are certain triples so there exist triples lambda mu and nu such that this is a one-dimensional space okay that turns out to be important um, okay since this is a one-dimensional space. Uh, even when we quantize, it means that these uh, these things will uh, Q commute. So th these guys, this algebra is not a quantum torus, but uh, when we uh, when we take G invariance and we consider these guys, they Q they Q commute. So that means there's some basis in which they just commute by powers of Q. And so what we can do is we can invert these. Okay. Um, and uh, and uh, the claim is that once we invert these, so the, the two-step process is we invert, and then we take G invariance, and and the thing that we get at that stage is a quantum torus. So, what do you mean by invert? I mean, we have some non-commutative algebra, and these are some elements in that algebra, and they don't have inverses in the algebra. We formally take their aura localization. Um, it's very useful if you're considering aura localizations to have Q commuting things, because then you can just not worry about fractions. You just have sort of non-commutative fractions. Okay. All right. All right. So. Um, right. So classic. There's some classical geometry here, which is if I consider triples of flags. Um, so what have I got? So sort of on this picture, associated to each of these edges, I'm supposed to, or each of these vertices really, I'm supposed to imagine I have a flag, F1, F2, and F3. And what's really happening in this, uh, once when I invert these things, is I'm asking that pairwise each of F1, F2, and F3 are in generic position as flags. And then there's a further gener genericity that I can ask. I can reflect flag one through flag two, and I want that to be generic with respect to flag three as well. So there's some, uh, I'll just say vial combinatorics for producing these charts. And it's a well understood thing. 
Okay. Um, and so what it allows us to do is in Conf3, uh, there's a subcategory of Conf3 Um, which is uh, which is just generated by this algebra. So uh, I take that algebra. Um, uh, let me call it A, uh, and uh, I invert these elements. Um, I, I invert these these guys, uh, and uh, and I consider modules for that thing uh, in RepQG. of Qt to the n, which is to say I just look at the subcategory where these operators happen to act invertibly. So it's a subcategory of here. And I should have mentioned, by the way, already for conf2 there's something similar going on. So conf2 contains, let me just say classically, so conf2 is g mod n mod n, and then I look at the um, uh, the, the t cross t action, uh, and I have the g action. Uh, and there's an open subset in here, uh, so, so this is conf2. Uh, there's an open subset where the two flags are in generic position. And, uh, and if I look at qc of conf2 tilde as a stack, this is just a monoidal category, which is rep t. And I want to stress something here. Um, in the formalism, I, I was uh, discussing with, with Sasha uh, Braverman that this can be rep QT uh, for the disk. But here, this is only monoidal. So I, I just mean rep T. So I'm, I'm claiming that there's a non-obvious equivalence. There's a, sub, a monoidal subcategory of QC conf 2, which is just rep T. And when we quantize, that remains uh, a rep T. So I'll write it this way, ZQ. Conf t is a monoidal category rep t. All right, so that so there's that's conf two, and that corresponds to this picture here. All right, so we're this getting. This is a subcategory. This is a subcategory. It's a monoidal subcategory. It's, it corresponds to an open substack of the uh, classical gadget. Okay, I'm running a bit uh, short on time. Where are the erasers? Oh, here we go. Okay, so I think I'll just have time to explain. So, okay. So, so just to summarize uh, what I've uh, what I've tried to explain is that conf three. We have this open uh, this the subcategory conf three. Uh, and this is isomorphic to some quantum torus, so modules over some quantum torus. And, uh, and it's the same quantum torus that uh, Fuck Antreff prescribes, so that's quite nice. And now what I need to explain is finally the amalgamation process, right? They define their invariant by uh, gluing triangles together. All right, so this is, uh, actually, I have to say, we were stuck for quite a long time. Uh, uh, before Ian Lay uh, um, jumped onto the project, and it was really this uh, important observation. So look, suppose I look at Conf four. So that's uh, you should think of that as a quadrilateral in Fock-Antreff picture, and I want to decompose that into triangles. So uh, pictorially, I want to draw a line like this. Okay. And now uh, Ayala Francis Tanaka tell us we have excision for uh, gluing along uh, cylinders. And here the cylinder that we're gluing along, so this is, so here's an obvious statement. This is a union of this triangle, union over this triangle. So why is drawing two lines, two vertical lines? Uh, this is the cylinder that we're going to glue. A, 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 this, is the, this is the interval direction. And this is the, 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 the direction. And what are we gluing over? We're gluing over this thing. So that's conf3. That's conf3. And that's conf2. 
Okay? So it's just a fact of life that the invariant, say, this is just one example, ZQ comp 4 is by excision just ZQ of comp 3 tensor with ZQ comp 3 over ZQ comp 2. Okay? And this is hard. This is a stack that we somehow, non continuous stack that we don't understand, but we can now uh, look at the tildes. Okay? And the tildes we do understand. This is a quantum torus, this is a quantum torus, and this is just rep T. So what that says in, in words is that these frozen variables, when we tensor over something which is just representations of a torus, and then we take T invariance for that torus, what it exactly prescribes is that we multiply these two things together and we force that we, we restrict to the, the degree zero subalgebra. And so taking uh, this is this is rep T, even when we quantize. And uh, and this uh, procedure, so excision from this from from excision follows the amalgamation prescription of funk contrast. So I'm, I'm already out of time. Um, so uh, let me just say that for a general surface, we just uh, write down a canonical formula. And when we compute it, we get exactly the cluster charts that were predicted by Fuck and Guntra. Thank you. And what do you do in three dimensions? Um, right, so, um, so, okay, without these restrictions, without the parabolic markings, um, we showed with uh, Brochet and Noah Snyder uh, using work of, uh, of uh, uh, Claudia's and uh, of um, Runa Haugseng, um, we showed that there's a 3D TFT that extends factorization homology. Okay, so you have this coborism hypothesis. You need to check some axioms, and we check those. Um, uh, and what general, I mean, start factorization homology of what? So the claim is uh, that if you take any rigid braided tensor category, it lives ca uh, canonically in some four category of such, and it's three dualizable okay. as soon as it's rigid. Rigid is all you need. So this echoes some results of uh, uh, Schomer Pries, Douglas Schomer Pries and Snyder for, a few, for tensor categories, and it's the braided analog of that. Um, so to define that four category, that's where we need uh, Claudia and uh, Theo Johnson Fried and, uh, and Runa Huxing's work. Uh, but then you just read the manual, you check some axioms, and you see that you have three dualizability as soon as you have rigidity. Um, so now, as I've said, uh, uh, rep QB serves as a one morphism from rep QG to rep QT in that, uh, in that same four category. And so in order to sort of uh, uh, consider not just a three-dimensional TFT, but a three-dimensional TFT with these defects, we need to understand dualizability Okay, and if we could understand that dualizability, then you could just sort of, um, uh, and if uh, uh, some topologists do some work for us, then you could uh, define sort of TFTs with, uh, with interfaces, and then you could implement the, uh, the uh, de Moffde, Gabella, uh, Gontroff, or at least some relative of it, for, for a given um, uh, triangulation. Um, so one direction is that uh, you'd like to, to know that you can make sense of some sort of drawing where you have sort of G out in space, T out in space, and B along some, along some uh, plane. And so there's some, some uh, hard technical uh, work that needs to be done there. Um, <coughs> another approach I should say is that inside any parabolic surface, you can just uh, cut away all of the parabolic bits, and then you just get a G surface, a surface colored by G, and, uh, and you can just try and do TFT with that instead. Um, so that would be a way to sort of bypass uh, these uh, these uh, uh, Borels, but um, yeah, it's this is a future hope, but it's certainly not something that's uh, that's in the works right now. Yeah. So does mean you can say that just surfaces without marked points? Or is that, is that what no, like um, 
so I mean if you have so I'll just explain you the dictionary like if you have some Fuck on trough surface like so. Okay, so I've said that this is B, T, G, and uh, B, T, G. Well, what I can do is I can just look at the sub stratified surface where, uh, where I just cut away that all the stuff that I don't like about T. So there's just a subsurface in here that has no markings, but I can regard it as a parabolically marked surface just in a trivial way. And this gives me functors from uh, our, our usual character variety that we uh, studied with David and Adrian. It includes into the parabolic one. So there's a functor, an inclusion of functor. Okay, and, and it, it comes from, in fact, it, what, it, what it tells you is something that people knew in some cases classically, which is that the AGS algebras have cluster embeddings. So this is something you can try to do by hand. You can take some you know, random non-commutative algebra and try and embed it as a subalgebra of a quantum torus. And uh, by, by thinking about this, uh, this picture, you get that the AGS algebra associated with this punctured surface it embeds into the corresponding cluster uh, uh, ensemble. And so that's, that's another thing you can do, yeah.